Um, welcome to our talk. We're going to be talking about system deifying post-market OS. My name is Clayton Kraft. I thought it would be uh, more appropriate to introduce myself in this conference uh, in terms of the init systems I've used over the years. Uh, keep in mind, I was like always a user of these things, never a developer for any of this. Um, and the capacity I've used them was anywhere from like installing Linux on my parents' computer, much to their dismay, uh, all the way to maintaining um, like 200 systems running system D in production. I've been contributing to PostMarket OS since 2017, and I'm one of the developers that's working on porting the distribution to system D. And uh, hey, I'm, I'm Caleb. Um, by day, I mostly work on the kernel and U-boot and lower level things. Uh, but for the last few years, I've been uh, contributing pretty heavily to PostMarket OS and, and trying to build a distro for you know, phones and embedded devices that uh, works for people. Um, I care a lot about the developer tooling. I, I use PostMarket OS at my day job for kernel development. So having a nice uh, like developer flow for building a kernel, putting it on the device, um, building an inner MFS, and, and like making that fast and uh, easy to do incrementally is pretty important to me. Uh, and more broadly, I, I care about usability and like having tooling that works, having um, you know, a, a community that, that works, and just building an environment where you can make good software, I guess. Um, yeah. So for the uninitiated, uh, PostMarket OS is a Linux distribution based on Alpine Linux. Um, we are very customizable. It was originally created for phones, but now targets like many different types of devices from smartwatches to laptops, servers, um, you name it, uh, people have ported the distro to it, seems like. Um, as a distribution and users ourselves, we care a lot about uh, supporting the upstream software that we depend on, so a lot of work we do is um, helping upstream software like find bugs, uh, submitting fixes to them for things, and we have a very active and vibrant community that we depend heavily on, and we'll get into this a bit more uh, later. And, and like people maintaining GNOME in uh, Alpine and KDE in Alpine. Yeah, yeah. All of these things. Um, so uh, PostMarket OS is really built around this one tool uh, called PM Bootstrap. Um, it does everything that you might want to do in the distro. Uh, you can build packages with it. You can cross-compile packages with it. You can build images for different devices. Uh, you can just generate a change route. The list really goes on, um, much more than, it, than is on here. Uh, you can use it to, like, for example, we do not build images for all the devices because there's hundreds of them. Uh, we only build images for a few, but if you want to try PostMarket OS on a device that we don't build images for, we want that to be as easy for you as, as, as possible. So having like um, PM Bootstrap there is, is pretty important. Uh, so it makes it super easy to build like modified versions of a package. You can clone some random like Git repository for um, a package in Alpine, like GNOME Shell, for example make your patches to GNOME Shell, and then use PM Bootstrap to build the package using your local sources with just like one command, and then install it on the device and test it. Um, and you can even use it to like run our CI locally. So if you're contributing to a package repository, we have a bunch of CI for like linting and, and um, uh, lots of linting, mostly linting. Yeah. <laughs> and so you can just use PM Bootstrap to like run it all in change routes on your local machine before you even push, so you don't have to wait for GitLab to do it for you. Uh, and it's really just all around this like one goal to make development easy. Um, so like I mentioned, you can uh, com cross compile your kernel locally, like as you would if you're working on any embedded platform. And then you can use BM Bootstrap to take those kernel artifacts and just stuff them into uh, a kernel package and then put it on your device. and run all the uh, packaging triggers to generate the inner MFS. If you're working on some like Android device, you need to generate a new Android boot image and flash it to the phone. And all of this is just like 
integrated into the packaging and handled uh, dynamically at runtime. Um, yeah, so like you mentioned, um, trying to make it easy to do development. And there's a reason we do this. It's because we're not a big distribution. Um, there's not a lot of people like very actively working on it uh, full time, for example, <laughs> like myself and, and maybe one other person. Um, there's lots of devices we support. Uh, we can't do that with like few people that have you know limited number of hardware. So we depend incredibly on like the community and trying to do stuff that helps them to contribute to our distribution um, because it's really our community that has been porting hundreds of devices to the distribution. It's our community um, by way of what we call a testing team that we've created that allows people in the community to join that have hardware. We can call upon them to do testing before releases. Um, but it's these community members who are volunteering their time and, and hardware to doing this testing that allows us to support like 100 devices in our stable releases. Um, we have a, a very extensive wiki that helps users to port new devices, debug, uh, run user interfaces, like add support for new user interfaces, like tons of stuff. And it's largely maintained by our community. Um, I mentioned upstreaming earlier, like there's a bunch of people that are working on doing upstream work. Uh, one good example of that is the Linux kernel. There's something like, um, like what, 200 patches that were submitted this year alone from people that are either porting the distribution to a device or are using PostMarket OS as a development platform for doing kernel work because it is easy to iterate and test Right, yeah, the, I think this, so we have a, a mailing list that you can CC with your kernel patches and the current stats are essentially that uh, over 200 patch series as of like August CC'd our mailing list, like V1 patches that, that people contributed. So there's quite a lot of people doing kernel development and they're using PostMarketOS to do it. And yeah, we, we think that's pretty neat. Yeah, it's awesome, um, <laughs> I think. Uh, and, but like one really important thing is we, we help, her, help each other out. Um, a lot of us are volunteering time and we understand like the stuff is hard to do, right? Um, porting devices and working with some of these embedded systems. And so there's like a number of chat rooms we have on Matrix for different topics that people can join. There's a lot of people that are active in there that want to help other people to like port new devices or debug the OS or um, yeah, any number of things. So um, yeah, it's, it's an awesome community that we have and we're really appreciative. Now, one thing that uh, we get asked a lot and we even asked ourselves quite a bit when we were looking at using system D and post market OS is uh, why Alpine Linux because um, it uses a different libc that's not supported in systemd that we'll get into a lot more later. There's like a lot of reason, like it's, it's known for using in containers and not like for running on bare metal stuff, for instance. Um, there's a lot of reasons like people can say why we shouldn't use it. Um, and if we were going to try to use systemd, honestly, it would have probably been easier if we just used a distro that had systemd already in it. But we feel like there's a lot of benefit to using Alpine Linux um, that makes it worth all the extra effort. For example, the packaging format and the tools that Alpine uses are really simple and easy to understand and really flexible. Like we can, we can ship configuration for systems that is a package. Um, and it's easy to create these packages and do all kinds of weird, fun stuff with them. And it allows us to support like, um, I don't know how many user interfaces, like I mean, six, eight, depends how 12, you count. Yeah, There's like lots. Technically 23, but oh wow. Um, yeah, okay, so a lot of user interfaces, hundreds of devices, and like all kinds of weird permutations mm -hmm. of these things and combinations and build images, and that's really due to the packaging system that Alpine uses. Like with the exception of the format that your root file system is in, everything else is composed at runtime through packaging and uh, configuration. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, another reason is the way they do releases is really nice. Um, you have like a standard rolling distribution, which is what you would expect. Updates are shipped as soon as they're merged by people that maintain packages. They also tag stable releases every six months. 
And in my experience using Alpine for quite a few years now, they just work like between upgrades. You can upgrade between stable releases and it's like boring, which is good. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you can even do things like run a stable release and upgrade directly to the rolling release. And it just works because the stable releases are tagged from the rolling branch, you know, every six months. So, um, which is useful for like testing and debug. And like another really cool thing about Alpine is they also have a great community of people maintaining the distro and are really passionate about seeing it succeed. They, um, they respect us as a downstream and we highly respect them as an upstream and we work together like really well so far. And, and that kind of shows in like some of the stuff we talk about later. Um, and like one of the re original reasons why Alpine was chosen as a base for this distro was because of its small root file system size. Uh, I mentioned that Postal Market OS was originally created for phones and some of the early phones were like really small storage space. Um, so yeah, small root file system size. Uh, there's kind of a joke here in that like Alpine U Linux uses BusyBox and the gzip version of BusyBox doesn't actually support the dash L command. So I had to install like the full gzip, but, but yeah, you know, small, small root file system. <laughs> Oop, too far. All right, so this is the fun part. Um, in English, there's a saying like, you don't really want to be stuck between a rock and a hard place, and uh, you know it's usually not too comfortable. Um, in our case, we kind of have these like three hard places, maybe four if you count some of our own self-imposed, uh, you know, <laughs> we're hard on ourselves because we want to build something that's really easy to use. But uh, yeah, so like there's, um, yeah. Muscle is probably like the first yeah. hard place you want to talk about here. <laughs> so systemd on, on muscle. Um, there's been a, a bit of a storied history over the last few years. Uh, I mean, to start with, for those unfamiliar, uh, muscle is generally much stricter than glibc. It aims for simplicity and like supporting static linking, uh, for example. And it's pretty uh, adherent to POSIX, where glibc tends to stray in favor of um, usability or new features and Linux specific things. Um, so there's been various historical attempts to build systemd for muscle. Uh, the most well known is the set of patches from some developers working on uh, open embedded. Uh, for having like uh, Yocto versions that run systemd on muscle. Um, from looking at these patches, they don't seem to be hugely concerned with like solving the underlying issues, uh, finding a, a, a real like way to get rid of the patches. It's just kind of hacking things around. A lot of the patches have like a uh, um, justification for them not being in upstream and they just say upstream rejected because muscle, which is a bit odd, I guess. Um, and there's lots of like stubbing out things that are broken that they don't really need. Obviously, this is not a great way to go long term. Um, there's kind of a, another sort of orthogonal effort which ties in here, which is uh, these projects like eLogND and EUDev, which are taking UDEV and LogND from, from SystemD and like building them standalone. And Alpine has been using these for a long time because these are kind of essential components for any like Linux, general purpose uh, Linux system. Um, more recently, a project called uh, Chimera Linux, which is also based on Muscle and uh, using APK, has taken a new approach, um, which is actually just directly fetching systemd, patching the build system, and building udev and logind standalone. Uh, whereas uh, elogind and eudev like took the code base and uh, pulled out just those components, did a new build system, patched lots of things, and um, then ended up being unmaintained, which is obviously not not fantastic. Uh, additionally, in PostMarket OS, we switched to using systemd boot by default. And so um, it's been kind of a problem. Like uh, Clayton's been maintaining this patch to build systemd boot standalone, 
Uh, like, it's not a muscle problem, it's just that we wanted systemd boot without systemd, and there isn't a nice way to, to, to build it and package it. Um, now, fast forward to today, uh, a lot of the simple muscle fitch fixes, which is like mostly header files and some very tiny like stubs are pretty much all merged upstream. There's still a few things pending and there's still some broader issues to solve. Um, but yeah, this diagram here is from uh, the blog post that we made at the beginning of this year where we, after a year of discussion, decided that we would go ahead with um, adding systemd. And I think Oli spent uh, many days writing this blog post because we wanted to make sure it was, uh, it was done right. So in terms of things that are still a problem, um, we have malloc trim. Seems pretty useful, but it isn't in POSIX. Muscle doesn't implement it. My current understanding is that uh, it doesn't map well to Muscle's malloc implementation. I don't exactly know what that means, but this is for sure um, something we should, at the very least, be conscious of going forward and probably find a solution to. Uh, there's pidfd spawn, which systemd is not yet using, as I understand it. You are? OK. If available. If available, right. Um, but this is going to likely become more of a thing that we want. And Muscle does not have it. It's not part of POSIX. Um, if you asked my naive self, I would maybe wonder why this doesn't get added to POSIX. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, there's NSS, which I also won't pretend to understand. Uh, upon doing some research, it seems like glibc's implementation involves loading libraries at runtime, which Muscle does not want to do, which seems somewhat uh, reasonable. But again, like NSS does things that we may need to care about. And then there's some format strings, which, like, why are we dealing with this in 2024? But yeah, um, so we need to do some strength training. Um, there's a bunch of stuff missing. For now, we're kind of getting by, but uh, with, I guess, I forgot to mention, um, we have roughly 12 patches on top of system D right now. Uh, it's, yeah, we're, we're getting by. Um, in the medium term, it looks like having some kind of shim between features that Muscle won't add or doesn't yet support and features that um, systemd and potentially other uh, like system programs that rely on glibc specific things like want or need. Uh, there's already a project called gcompat which handles running binaries compiled for, for glibc on Muscle systems, but it does not include header files. It doesn't support building um, like glibc programs in a Muscle environment. So perhaps this is a good place to start. Um, one of the things that we need to get to is adding Muscle CI to systemd once we have a, a way forward here. So we can make sure that at least when we get to this solution that we can avoid like regressing uh, for as long as we have people to work on it. And then long term, I think uh, for a few things, we'll hopefully have some paths forward to get things added to POSIX and implemented in Muscle. Um, but yeah, really, this is something we need help with. Uh, this is something that I think Systemd surely isn't the only project where this would be useful. And if you like working on Lipsy code or know someone who does, um, definitely reach out and, and we're interested in, in moving this forward uh, since it seems like there's, there's other people um, <clears throat> also interested in like systemd on muscle and, and things like this. So yeah. Um, on to the, the other tech debt that I didn't mention. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, yeah, using Alpine Linux, uh, they've been very happy using uh, OpenRC as their init system for a number of years now, uh, at least when you're running it you know, outside of a container environment. 
and there's like some they, they basically don't support the merge user uh, file system layout that systemd and like modern distros kind of expect um, we like beginning of this year we filed an issue with alpine saying please support this we'll help you uh, immediately got a response that um it was basically like, what, what even is this merged user thing? Like, it's not really documented clearly. Like, is there a specification? There was a reference to the, um, the file system hierarchies spec, uh, or whatever it's called, FHS. Uh, we went there, of course, like, doesn't mention it. Um, hasn't been updated in many years. We sent an email to the Linux Foundation who confirmed that the FHS is essentially like unmaintained, they said, yeah, if you wanna see improvements, do it yourself. Um, okay, so we started looking around, like how do other distros do this? Like how does Fedora do it? Um, how does Debian do it? We found some information on the Fedora wiki about a change request in like 2014 or so that was like, here's how we wanna do this. Um, we looked at Debian, found something similar, I think on their wiki and uh, Caleb started doing a lot of work to prototype this, and, and I think you may have noticed in Fedora, like, there's an issue with, um, like, they created a symlink to user SBAN, right? And someone noticed, like, Debian doesn't do this. So uh, the question came up, like, what's the right way to handle this thing? Um, again, there's no documentation, really. And then suddenly we found there's a man page in systemd for the file hierarchy. Uh, maybe should be part of the UAPI spec. Um, but yeah, so like we went back to Alpine again and said, like there's this thing here, um, what do you think? Can we start like doing work in the distro to support merged user? And they said, yes, uh, there's still some confusion though about the user SBIN thing. Um, but that aside, we've been able to submit a number of patches since they approved this like a month or two ago, I think. Uh, yeah, a lot of patches are already going to Alpine now to start moving things into user directory um, from slash bin and slash lib, um, which, which is exciting. great. Yeah, yeah there yeah. is a, a milestone now on Alpine's GitLab, uh, so you can follow along. Uh, if you like Alpine and want to help move Alpine into 2024, then <laughs> it's a good place to go. Yeah, um, and like at first we were kind of annoyed with Alpine's response, like you know, put it in the FHS seemed kind of like a cop out on, you know, first, uh, the first interpretation of that. And, uh, <laughs> but like, honestly, I can, I, I understand where they're coming from. You want this stuff in a specification because as a distro, when you move files around, there's some risk that like existing installations break, users get upset, things are not where they expected, or like maybe applications are doing weird stuff with hard coded paths or, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> and so like you only want to do this thing once, right? You don't want to like move and then somebody later decides, oh, maybe this other thing should be a, a sim link and, and then they move it in their distro and maybe the consensus is in agreement with that for now, but then, you know, a few years from now, maybe people are, have a different opinion and it kind of the consensus moves again and then suddenly you're the odd one out because again, there's no spec for this, so. Um, yeah, that's my spec rant um, <laughs> for this kind of thing. So yes, like please have this in the UAPI uh, spec somewhere so we can say, Alpine, look, there's a specification. Uh, we'll do the work for you, but you know, here's the justification for the work we're doing. All right. uh, yeah. Nice. Cool, cool, cool. So um, at some point, hopefully, <laughs> If uh, we play our cards right, we will have systemd in post market OS. Um, it is not quite yet merged. Uh, we have a, a kind of staging branch for it, but we'll get there, and then we get to move on to the next big topic, which is immutability. Um, from my side, I kind of thought about this, and my first thought is, wow, I really don't want to run a package manager on my phone especially on a rolling branch, uh, things break. And like last year, PostMarketOS didn't have any kind of recovery environment either. So if you're running PostMarketOS Edge and you install an update and the package repository is like halfway through building some like library version bump or something, then 
your system could just be broken now and there's nothing you can do. You reboot and it just gets stuck and you're on a phone, so it's not like you have a keyboard to type on. Um, y yeah, you're just kind of screwed. Um, and if you don't get screwed by the package manager, then you might just get screwed by random corruption. Like if you run out of battery or, or something else goes wrong and now like, I don't know, your libc is, is missing or broken. Um, so we want to avoid these things. Uh, and of course, we want to have some kind of like verification that the system you're running on is, is what you expect it to be. Um, so currently, uh, my kind of understanding of, of immutability and how it would work in post OS is that we really have kind of a culture issue. Uh, the post market OS and I think largely like Linux users who are super into tinkering with their system and stuff tend not to like immutable all that much. I think that is changing and improving. Um, Fedora had approaches uh, like Toolbox. Um, there's been tools like DistroBox as well, which aim to make it easy for you to be able to like hack around a bit. Uh, RPM OS tree was another implementation. And while these are great, um, I mean, they don't fully solve the underlying issues. Um, for example, RPM OS tree does not let you do DM Verity. And um, really, like, as a developer and a user, I want to take the device that I'm daily driving and I want to go like, ah, I need to do some hacking on this. And, and then I want to just install packages, build software, like upgrade the kernel, do whatever I want to do. And then I want to go to bed and be like, ah, crap, I forgot. And just reboot the phone and have it be back to like something safe that I know works. Uh, that's been tested. And this is something that doesn't seem to have a really agreed upon um, decision. Uh, earlier in the week, um, we discussed this at the uh, image-based Linux summit, and there were a lot of interesting points brought up. Um, I think there's some ideas here, but I think it just needs more exploring in general. Um, but yeah, broadly, like, we've we found a lot of success in post-market OS by kind of blurring the line between developer and user. If you want to use the distro and install it on your phone, chances are you will have to use our tooling to build yourself an image, and we make that super easy. And then you notice that something doesn't work, and you go to fix it, and you find out there's like nice wiki pages, and people will help you. And before you know it, you're like contributing to a distro and getting stuff fixed, and people are thanking you for it. And this is really like this model has worked really well for us to to get people on board. Um, so the last thing that we want is to start shipping an immutable post market OS that makes these things harder and like pushes away people who would potentially become contributors because the hurdle uh, to to get involved is is too difficult. Like if they have to build their own images, uh, like Delta images. Um, if that's too complicated, or they have to reboot to test stuff. Maybe too much. Um, so yeah, lots of things up in the air, but um, I think a kind of tentative plan is to have some kind of wrapper around the package manager and uh, make use of OverlayFS and just some, some kind of intelligent tooling so that you're able to enable some kind of developer mode, install packages more or less as you would, uh, maintain like the packages you've added across OS updates and um, mostly be able to do what you're doing and then revert back to a stable system like at the end of the day. Uh, so regarding like immutability generally, um, we still have a lot of tech debt from Alpine, a lot of packages and still things in VAR and ETC that we can't do a whole lot about, uh, adopting things like temp files, systemd temp files, is definitely a long-term goal. Um, and I'm a little bit worried that we end up picking a partition layout that we change our minds about later. Uh, so if anybody has ideas on that, I'd definitely be, be interested to hear them. Um, but yeah, broadly, like AB, DM Verity, system, uh, system D, system D, system update, 
and Delta is especially important. And um, yeah, there's kind of developer mode thing. Uh, there's an open issue on GitLab about this uh, with a very nice proposal from um, uh, Asta, uh, just soup in, in the matrix channels. And yeah, I'm pretty excited. Um, I guess that's that. I think that's that. I think what's kind of cool about this, um, so like I've been heads down on trying to get the system D stuff. Sorry. I've been like heads down on trying to get the system D stuff wrapped up, uh, at least the initial stuff in, in post market OS, and haven't really had time to do any of the planning for like what immutable uh, solution we ultimately come up with. What's cool is like we created this milestone, and some people in the community who have like, you know, maybe done some contributions here and there have shown up and are like really passionate about seeing immutable uh, root file system support in the distro have just like started throwing out ideas and trying to be really helpful and, and helping us design the solution for this, um, which is great because like, I, yeah, like I, I'm busy with this thing. Caleb's got a lot of other stuff going on. Um, we have people just showing up in, from our community who just like want to help us design stuff like this. And that's awesome, uh, which means, you know, when we're free, we can go and, and review their designs and finalize a plan. And you know we have a head start. We can just start working on it at that point. Um, so yeah, great job, community. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, there's room for you too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Then I guess that's it. Um, thanks a lot. For, for so questions, but first, I mean, your point about. UPI group that makes total sense to have the user merge spec there. We should do that. No brainer. Send us a PR. <laughs> it's, no, it's just Markdown, right? So if you want to, otherwise we can take care of that. The other uh, other questions? Questions from the audience? Okay. <laughs> Any questions? I have a question otherwise. Uh, actually, two. Um, you mentioned in one of the previous slides. You had troubles uh, building systemd boot by itself, but we should be able to do that. Uh, In our, you do ninja no. systemd boot and yeah, it didn't work like that. All right, um, I I had a few implementations. It's actually a little better now, but it still requires patching the Mason file. Okay, like, I want that to work. We I'll should show be you able. What I've done, and you can sort of like open a bug. Just to... open a bug on GitHub. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Because I want that to work. Awesome. Because you know it's a P binary; it doesn't need the rest, right? Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> it's a UFI application. Like, why do you? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a naive question: Why not build systemd statically? Because um. we don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Especially. Does Letter can answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, don't do that. Like, we spend a lot of time of uh, uh, making, like, we have this lip system we shared thing that is linked into all our binaries. And the reason we have this is because we have like 200 binaries or something. And if we would just, if you statically link this, it does not work. It's going to explode in your face and being massively huge. So, I mean, shared library exists for a reason. And that reason is to share code. Um, and uh, uh, we do that. So, do not try to build systemly statically. Yeah, we, we've also run into other really strange issues with uh, like programs talking to each other. Um, for example, something to do with like IO sensor proxy inverting values on muscle and geo. There's some strange incompatibilities, and yeah, generally this would add a, a lot of complexity um, for not much gain. I think it's like for the two shared libraries, 15 megabytes in total, so I times so. 200, yeah, goodbye <laughs> for your 10 megabyte root of S. So, so a comment on the static linking. So we have partial support for building some stuff statically, and then you kind of do, is it what you want? But it only works if you do it in a, in a small scope. If you try to do it at a large scope, then, then things become really inefficient. Any other questions? I have another question. So uh, for the work you do on PostMarket OS, of course, there's a lot of device-specific things. Have you come across anything in System D that uh, had problems on some specific device, but not others? Just curiosity. 
Uh, nothing so far. For the mo we haven't opened up uh, the systemd branch to broader testing yet because there's been a whole lot of churn going on um, and there's still issues with like uh, upgrading packages. Um, I don't expect that to be much uh, since, yeah, uh, most devices are pretty similar. It's, it's mostly like the the bootloader and you know the the, the kernel side of things. Um, yeah, okay. nothing comes yeah. to mind. Any other questions? Um. What's the what's the communication like with upstream um, Alpine on the whole systemd effort? Like, do you intend to carry these patches, the packages downstream, or do you eventually want to get them up into um, Alpine itself? Uh, good question. Uh, so, the biggest issue we have. Uh, so currently, we carry everything in in post market OS. Um, the biggest issue that we have is actually unit files because Alpine strip all system to unit files from packages. Uh, we're in discussions with them about setting up uh, sub packages. So they have sub packages for the OpenRC, uh, like init scripts, adding them for systemd as well, and um, including them is, that work is, is in progress. Uh, mostly a social issue, not so much a technical one. Um, long term, it's really like up to Alpine, but I think there's quite a lot of interest from other parties in having systemd in Alpine. So yeah, um, I'm interested to see where it goes. And Alpine supports multiple init systems as well. So like, right. this would just be another one in theory. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, follow up to what you just said. Um, the I am aware that Alpine has this at least like abstract goal with S6. Have you like? Do you consider this like colliding interests? But if somebody said there is multiple in the system support already, then I guess that isn't really an issue. Yeah, um, I could take that one. Sure. Yeah. yeah so, um, like the way that that Alpine, at least like a design goal I've heard repeated a few times, is they want it to be like not dependent upon any particular component, right? You're able to sort of pick and choose and you can actually run Alpine without OpenRC in containers, for instance. Um, and so there's a lot of emphasis to like try to make it configurable. And like, even if you take this, this whole system, do you think out of the picture entirely um, and they want to move to S6, they're going to also have to support OpenRC at least for some time, right? There's a transition period. So like this isn't really a new problem that is relevant because we're talking about system D. It's like something they would have to do anyways. And yeah, like if they're did, one of their goals is to try to support as many as they can, like, you know, here's another one for you, basically. Yeah, uh, come come talk to us after if, if you want more info. Uh, you mentioned that you want to do A B booting. Um, I suspect that many of these phones have different protocols to talking to the bootloader to do selection and confirming and so on. So how do you plan to handle that? Yeah, okay. Uh, this is true. Uh, there's Qualcomm have their own method where they use um, uh, vendor the, the vendor bits in the GPT. Uh, the Android like reference implementation, which I think MediaTek uses, uh, just uses some like MISC partition, I think, on, on the device. Um, the plan after, well, so post-market OS, historically, everything is stuck with whatever the lowest common denominator is. Uh, whatever the crappiest phone that we care about does, everything else can only do that. I think we're going to have a bit of a shift here and start uh, having higher expectations for devices. Um, I've been really heavily involved over the last year in bringing up U-Boot on Qualcomm platforms. And as a result, uh, a whole lot of like Qualcomm phones that are supported in post-market OS now have the capability to run U-Boot and therefore boot with EFI. So the the, um, I think the idea is, is that we'll have an EFI specific implementation which will work on U-Boot and on like, you know, EDK2, x86 devices, like what normal distros are doing, and kind of ignore the Android stuff um, since 
until now, most of the devices we support are all uh, like past end of life, so we don't need to worry about uh, like bootloader updates since there aren't any. Um, Last question. Uh, there was a question, was kind of an answer to the uh, 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 question earlier here regarding the upstream ability and uh, getting them into systemd. I just wanted to say that, like our our perspective on getting things upstream was always that we think libc is kind of the API of Linux, right? Like, and so over the years we always said that Muzzle should fix their shit and provide the same functionality. Now, in most of these cases, the, the problems went away because Muzzle learned stuff and things like that. Um, and other things happened uh, where we didn't require the GNU you know, interfaces anymore. But yeah, the, the things that are on the slide, like the, the four ones are kind of the, the, the things missing. But I'm pretty sure, yeah, that those, um, these ones are not on us. Um, like, this is something that uh, uh, the people doing Muzzle have to fix uh, because we can not reasonably sh ship this. I mean, the pit of despawn, we of course do have compatibility because old Glipsy doesn't do it. But uh, yeah, uh, so much about the upstream ability of this all. Yeah. So I think besides these three things, I don't see there's anything left, like anything major relevant that wouldn't be fixable. On. And Malotrim is completely optional. Just put a stub there. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing is like, the thing about Malotrim is always like, you know, if you focus on, on small machines, right, like that have little resources, and I would figure that if cell phones kind of qualifies as that, like we implemented so much stuff with system, the OOMD and things like that, so that we can handle uh, memory pressure. Mm -hmm. And the primary thing that we do in memory pressure is call that fucking function. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you don't have that function, then of course we cannot rea react to memory pressure, which kind of matters if you have a little memory, right? So um, mm -hmm. I don't know, my response to this, of course, muzzles probably not for embedded devices, um, which is probably some controversial. Uh, controversial opinion, but yeah. All right, uh, thank you very much for your talk. All right, thanks.